Our main speaker is a partner and a friend. Re Rebecca Witzman began her journey into non-theistic activism after going viral when she came out as an atheist on CNN after saving her and her son's lives from a tornado that destroyed her home. She is a once a month co-host of the radio program Ask an Atheist with Sam Mulvey. She sits on the board of Humanists of Washington, is the lead organizer for the upcoming Rainier Oasis. Applause. Um, but her most significant contribution to the atheist movement is through her work as a creator and development coordinator of Humanist Disaster Recovery Teams for Foundation Beyond Belief. This past January, Rebecca was the team leader of the first HDR Teams deployment, assisting in the rebuilding efforts of the 2015 flooding of Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rebecca Vitzman. Hello, how's everybody doing? Everybody here? Yay! <laughs> okay, so a lot of people uh, do know me through that Wolf Blitzer interview um, after that tornado destroyed my house. Um, but what they don't know is a story that happened about a week later um, that involved my atheism um, and the tornado. And so I'm going to go over that just briefly because that's a story that really propels me and drives me forward and is the reason why I'm even here today. So after the disaster, I was sitting in my home and I was trying to get everything done. The bulldozers were coming, everything's got to be taken care of that can be taken care of. You have to have everything shoveled to the curb, and that means everything that you want to go through has to be gone through before these bulldozers come. And I was trying to get as much done as possible before that happened. So two women approached me and they said, hey, we're with you know this Baptist church and we'd really like to help if that's okay. And I was like, yes! Help me! You know, and so they came and they were helping me, and we were going through my son's belongings. And at that moment, the woman, you know, one of the women said, "So, which church do you go to?" <laughs> and I didn't want to drop an A bomb on these ladies, and so I was like, "Oh, I don't, I don't go to church." And they, and the person said, "You're raising this baby without Jesus." And I was, you know, like. I mean, like, I, my whole life is destroyed. I'm going through his destroyed belongings, and I'm like, like, punched in the gut like I'm a horrible mother. And I just said, yep. <laughs> I most certainly am, you know, like, oh, I didn't know what to do. But I, was, I, I didn't want to lose their health, though. It was so meaningful to me to be able to take care of more things that I didn't want to lose their hands at that moment. So I suddenly felt like I needed to protect her. And so what I ended up doing was just kind of nodding a lot. She kept telling me, you know, like, oh, God put her in my life to bring me back home to him. He just wanted to envelop me and my baby in his love and love, blah, 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 blah. And I just kept saying, okay, all right, okay, well, you know, if you could just take care of this thing that's over there. <laughs> like, I would really appreciate that. Thank you so much. You know, and so after, you know, but, you know, I was really upset, though, and the thought that kept getting me through is, I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to find an atheist organization to volunteer with. I'm going to find them tonight. In fact, I'm going to find them, and if they're doing this inside of some Christian's house, I'm going to tell them that they're wrong, and that they need to not do that. You know, it's just like, if there's anybody saying, like, ooh, where's your God now? You know, like, don't do that. That's a bad idea. Their life's destroyed. Like, and so, uh, you know, after she was ready to leave, you know, I, she said, you know, well, I hope I've inspired you. And I said, oh, you have. <laughs> she has no idea. Look at you, lady. You started a woman. <laughs> and so, but I went home and I started to try to find an atheistic disaster relief program to become involved in. And I just kept Googling things and like, atheist disaster recovery, you know. Uh, is it humanist? What, 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 what am I missing? What are the key terms that I'm not putting in to find this on Google? And I started to talk to friends of mine and people throughout the movement. They're like, oh yeah, that doesn't exist. I was like, what? How is that possible? Like, how do we, we I mean, as atheists, I, I love to think about the world without religion. I love to think about like, oh, it's all puppies, kittens, and rainbows without religion. But then we're not set up in a way to take care of disasters. And they're just going to keep happening. And as a human species, we have to be able to take care of that. And we don't have things in place to do that without religion at this point. And so um, 
I started to think about, well, what do we have? And so, um, non-theistic disaster recovery, what does that look like? Because that, that does exist, um, but it looks very different inside and outside of our community. So I'm gonna go over about what those two things look like uh, to the world today. Um, so right after the disaster, uh, this was the cover article of Time Magazine, one month after the disaster, so I'm gonna go ahead and read it. Um, there was an occupying army of relief workers led by local first responders, exhausted but still humping it a week after the storm. Church groups from all over the country. Funny how you don't see organized groups of secular humans could now have this. Okay, you can't read that without that tone because it's mocking. What he's doing there is saying, oh, isn't it funny how they have no desire to help people at all? That's not what it is. In fact, what he's doing here is he could, he's, you know, what we're missing is infrastructure. He's comparing us to organizations that have been around for decades. He's comparing us to religions that have been around for thousands of years. We're new and we're just now building. But yeah, he's right. We're lacking the infrastructure and we don't have this kind of thing in place. It's not a funny how you kind of situation though. This is like a teenager who's like, oh, that five-year-old's so slow. He can't keep up with me in a foot race. You know, like, it doesn't make any sense. And it's actually not true. There is a non-theistic disaster recovery that exists. So I'm gonna go over what that looks like currently. And so first there's disorganized uh, individual volunteering. Uh, this is actually a bad thing. And so this is like when an atheist is just like, well, I don't have a group to go with, but I really want to help. So I'm going to go there right now. <laughs> and unfortunately, um, those people end up being kind of a detriment to the scene because they're not part of the system. And whenever you have a completely collapsed infrastructure in place, systems are very important. Um, next is silent non-theists working through theistic organizations. I hear this one a lot where they're just like, well, I wanted to help. I knew it was part important to be part of a system, so I went with a church group and just didn't say I was an atheist. Um, and then there is finally Lord Little organization sending untrained volunteers in the field. This is actually super important and great. You know, like if something happened, Tomorrow, and um, you know, Houston Oasis was able to form a partnership with somebody who's working in their backyard. You guys can do really amazing things, but it's this kind of thing is not you're not set up to do that. You're not prepared to do that. That's not what your organization is for. But you'll be able to do that, and that is what non-theist like uh, the most organized non-theistic contribution to disaster recovery right now is groups like Houston Oasis. Who, there's a disaster in the backyard and they become involved at that point. But Joe Klein was not wrong that we don't have something ready to go. We don't have infrastructure in place. We don't have a group designed to take care of disasters around the country. And so that is whenever I was like, no, this has to exist, no. And so I started talking to anybody who would listen to me and finally a friend of mine pointed me in the direction of Foundation Beyond Booty. Who I love, yay! Okay, I'm gonna talk about them just briefly though. There's actually, um, uh, we do have brochures that goes over all the different programming of Foundation Beyond Belief, um, and so we'll have those if anybody's interested. But two of the programs really stood out to me that night when I was looking at it, and the first is Beyond Belief Network. Beyond Belief Network is amazing. Um, right now, there's 125 teams in more than 30 states, and over 100,000 volunteer hours have been donated. So what, Beyond Belief Network is, is uh, groups of organizations similar to Houston Oasis who are sending in their totals, telling, you know, Foundation Beyond Belief what work they're doing in their local communities so that we can paint a picture for people to look at and say, throughout the country, this is what's going on. This is what non-theists are doing. This is what secular people are doing in their own local communities. And so while, you know, you let's say you're, uh, where did you guys go? You were doing the... Books Between Kids, right. You would submit your hours for Books Between Kids, and so how many hours did you guys donate? Do you know? A lot. Let's, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, oh, 50, okay. Well, we'll say 50. Well, let's say that it's 50 hours for Houston Oasis, but it's 50 out of 350 throughout the country yesterday. And so what happens is you have more and more of a picture of what the entire country is looking like throughout the non-theistic community. And I was like, yes, this is so cool. Volunteers, I need that. <laughs> and then the next one was um, Crisis Response. And so Crisis Response is a program uh, dedicated to collecting donations for secular organizations working on the ground after the disaster. Um, some of you might have seen Foundation Beyond Belief was collecting donations for um, the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew. 
Um, and that is still ongoing, so if uh, anybody wants to go to foundationbeyondbelief.org and contribute to that, that's our ongoing one right now. But whenever I saw these two programs, the thing that I saw was a focus on volunteers and a focus on disasters. That's not very far away from disaster volunteers. And so I immediately began to prepare my elevator speech to go convince Dale McGowan, who was the then executive director of Foundation Beyond Belief, that he needed to do this really desperately. And so I, I approached him. Um, he was speaking in Oklahoma that week, strangely enough. And he said that uh, his uh, director of special projects, Noelle George, who is the now executive director of Foundation Beyond Belief, and she's in the back corner, so that's our executive director. But at that time, she had already approached him about taking Foundation Beyond Belief in that direction. So it wasn't even a sell. He was just like, oh yeah, I'll just put you in touch with her. She really wants to do that. <laughs> so I was like, oh, my dreams, yay. Okay. And so uh, over the last two years, we've created uh, humanist disaster recovery teams. Um, crisis response, that previous program is now called Humanist Disaster Recovery Drive, and it's a part of our Humanist Disaster Recovery Umbrella Program um, that's run by Foundation Beyond Belief. So, Humanist Disaster Recovery Teams, our mission is to provide non-theists an avenue through which to uh, volunteer in communities impacted by disaster. So, I'm going to go quickly over what this, we, we spent a lot of time uh, carefully choosing what we called this program. We wanted it to be accurate, we wanted it to be important, and we wanted it to say what it was. And so the big word in here is recovery, because there's there's two words that are really get thrown around during disasters. You know, relief is one of them, and that's just everything. But there's response and recovery, and there's a major difference between the two. So I'm gonna co cover those really quickly. Um, so response. That um, is evacuation, it's getting people out of the immediate area. Let's say there's a flood, you want to get people out of areas where it could be flooding. Um, securing resources, food, water, shelter for those who have been impacted. Search and rescue, um, we all know what that is. Uh, medical intervention for those who have hurt themselves. And then finally, debris removal to clear paths for aid. So all of this is extremely important, but this is stuff that is not done by nonprofits. This is done by people, response teams, they're prepared, they're trained, they know what they're doing. Going and being a part of a response is something you can't actually do as a nonprofit. Even Red Cross is sanctioned by the federal government. And so this is not the area in which uh, we even can be involved. Obviously, if we could grow to a point like that, over time, that would be something we'd be open to, but um, instead, we stay where we're, where we're needed and where it's important. So, but as an organization, you can be involved in local responses. And there are ways to actually be a part of that to get your training. And one of those is um, CRT, that's Community Emergency Response Teams. This is free training given by the federal government that teaches you how to do all kinds of things. I took mine for Seattle. I know how to lift a thousand pound beam off of a human being who's being crushed to death. Isn't that cool? I don't know. Uh, yeah? Me too. Oh yeah, nice. We got somebody back there, yeah. I, right, I, I know how to be involved in a response. I know what to do. I know how to choose whether or not I can go into a building based upon the way that it looks. It's like, oh no, I can't even go in there. Like, I know the difference between I can go in there and not. You don't. Most of you don't. <laughs> and it's important information if you're going to be involved in a response. And so, um, CRT teams, they uh, will train you for the types of disasters you might experience in your local area. So you're not gonna learn about earthquakes, but you will learn about floods and anything else that might take, maybe tornadoes or something like that, that will take place in your area. And I, I highly suggest anybody get involved, it's free. It's amazing, free, free. <laughs> like how often does that happen in life? Um, and then finally, Red, Trust, uh, Red Cross training and certification, that's First aid, CPR, those are always good to know for anybody. So we're not involved in that, but you can be involved in that. What we are involved in is recovery. This is restore, rebuild, reshape. These are the three um, components to a recovery. Res restoration is uh, cleanup, provision of temporary housing, and restoration of public services. We might be involved in this uh, if it's a flood that takes several months um, to get through the cleanup efforts. And so if it's part of a flood, we might be involved in that. If it's a tornado, the, the cleanup effort lasts about a week. 
to, for nonprofits to actually get involved in, in a, a disaster such as a tornado, it's very rare. And so um, next is the rebuild. This is where we find ourselves more often. Um, this is the major repair work takes place, people return to homes and work and school resume. That major repair work, that is where nonprofits are really needed. This is when uh, those who aren't covered by insurance, those who don't have the means to be able to take care of themselves, so, you know, and don't have FEMA coming in to help them, are left with nothing. And at that point, nonprofits can say, oh, this person needs help. They need volunteers. They won't be able to recover without volunteers. And that's really whenever you have nonprofits step in because these are the people who need it most. Sorry. <laughs> um, and then finally, reshape, but that's part of recovery. I put it in there, but it's improved infrastructure and better disaster planning. Um, this is uh, the kind of things that, you know, don't, don't build in this flood area. And, you know, if you build um, homes in, a, in an earthquake area, then you make sure that they're prepared to withstand an earthquake. So, um, what we're bringing that's a little bit different though are human service values. That is what sets us apart right now from the other uh, disaster recovery programs that are out there in the country. And I'm going to go over those really quickly. Uh, we like to think of this as survivor first. So, um, the first is the experience belongs to the survivor. So whenever I was standing in my home and that woman came into me, uh, like into me, I'm like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's how I felt. I felt very violated. She's in my home. I'm sitting there, you know, going through all the emotions of letting this go. But she's not understanding that that experience that I'm going through is my experience with my home. She's inside of it. She's inside of my world that's been destroyed, you know? And so um, that's something we're very, very specific about. That when we walk into somebody's home, we're walking into their home. We're not there to bring them our thoughts and, and change them and make them become something different and make them feel bad about whoever they are. That's the opposite of what they need at that point. Um, next is we listen to their needs. How do we understand what they need from us? And so it's really funny how needs are very, very different after a, you know, after a, a disaster because my husband was like, where are all the papers? I need papers. Oh no, I need all the graphics cards. And you know, he wanted to dissect all his computers and that, that's what he needed though, to feel comfortable, to feel okay again. I couldn't care less about papers. I was like, what? We can just go and get more papers. Like, we can just print them out. <laughs> you know, I, that was mine. But I was like, but there's this ring, and if I don't find this ring, I'm going to cry forever. You know, and so my need was that ring. And so it's being able to understand that every single individual is going to be experiencing that traumatic scenario in a different way and, and being there for them and, and telling them, it's okay, I'm, I'm here to help you and I will help you do those little things that you say make you better instead of going in and saying, well, I'm here to do this thing that I told, you know, I came here to shovel a bunch of stuff to the curb and that's all I'm here to do. No, you're not. You're here to help and being the help that they need involves listening to what they need. Um, taking them seriously, that's another major one because I actually expressed a couple of needs to volunteers that were not heard. I told, you know, I was looking for things, as very specific ones, and I would find them in the pile of trash by the curb and I would just cry every time. I'm like, this, if I didn't notice this, I would have lost it. And I said I needed it. <laughs> like, and no one heard me. And so it was just, you know, it was just this experience, but like, um, I felt not heard. And that is one of the hardest things to really go through. I've talked to a lot of survivors and, and really it's being listened to and being heard and being like feeling as though people understand you because you're so far away from humanity at that point. It's very difficult. Um, and then finally, be the extra hands. That's what you are. Your hands, they, you know, if they could do absolutely everything for themselves, they would do it. I guarantee you, if they had a thousand hands, they would take care of it because then it would be done exactly the way you wanted. But instead, it's, you know, you're, you're there to listen to what you're supposed to be doing and then to use your hands to be able to help them to recover. So that's not scary. Oh no, oh no. The secular people are bringing, listening to people and taking them seriously to disaster recovery. Weird. But no, it's, it's not scary at all. In fact, I think it's very empowering to the survivor. Um, and so we did have our first uh, deployment. This is our team that was uh, in Columbia, South Carolina. We came from seven states um, to be a part of a week-long uh, recovery process. And uh, we also worked with a local organization uh, that was there. We were um, 
our partner was St. Bernard Project. We had 18 volunteers and we donated, I think we're, we're uh, we've settled at about 476 hours um, that were donated during that week. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, the work we were working in the rebuild, so we were demolishing things. I love this picture. Look at all those ladies with crowbars. I love it. <laughs> that makes me so happy. I like that. I really enjoyed. Like when we first got there, we were like, oh, how are we gonna be able to even do this? And then once we were doing this, you know, once they put us on like lesser tasks later, we're like, no, we want to continue to demolish things. This is fun. <laughs> um, and then uh, we did mold remediation. That means we had to be, you know, head to toe in hazmat suits with a mask and everything, which was fun for everyone. Um, and then we were hanging and patching drywall, mudding, and then sanding and taping and then priming. And so the way this works is that we are part of an organization that has built to a point that they can stay there and go through the long-term recovery. St. Bernard Project is still there. Anybody who would like to go and volunteer with St. Bernard Project to continue this work in South Carolina can go there and do that. And that's very important for Foundation Beyond Belief to be involved in and partner with these people who are committed to the area who will be there through the long-term recovery. So we are adding to this bigger picture. It's sort of like Beyond Belief Network. It's this beautiful picture in which the entire area recovers and we get to go and be this small portion. Um, and so that was, we did that with three different homes while we were there. And then finally, bridging the gap. So what happens when you're the only non-theistic organization working in disaster recovery? That means you're working alongside theistic organizations during recovery, and we certainly did. Um, and we ran into them and we worked side by side with them a few times and the, and the experiences were all kinds of different ones but they were really, really fun. Um, but one stood out, it was such a beautiful moment. So this uh, organization called Quotes for Compassion came down from Ohio and they were handing out, you know, um, quilts that they had made to the homeowners of each place and, it, and they give a quilt for every single person who lived there. So if there's four person home, four quilts. Uh, but for all the volunteers who were there, they would hand out these little quilted squares. And so they asked if they could give us quilted squares, and Noelle George was actually there, and she's like, she was very forward, and she's like, because they said, well, we'll pray for you, and she said, well, we're actually a secular organization. She's like, oh, well, then we'll just keep you in our thoughts. And it was so nice. We were like, what? Yeah, this is the world I want to live in. And so we took a picture with our quilted squares because it was just, just this moment where we were like, everybody could see eye to eye, everybody could understand there were humans helping humans and there was nothing else there. It was just human beings helping human beings and nothing more than that. And it was really beautiful. And so on the very last day of our deployment, we went around the room to say, what was your favorite moment of this? And two women selected this moment because it was so meaningful to them to have that and to feel like it was okay. Everything was nice. <laughs> and so, um, getting involved. If you would like to register for HDR Teams, you can go to foundation, foundation, beyondbelief.org slash HDR Teams. Um, if you have any uh, development ideas, you can send them to HDR Teams at foundationbeyondbelief.org. We are currently planning to have a uh, recovery um, in either Louisiana or Texas, but right now it looks like it's probably going to be Louisiana. But we will be contacting anybody in our database who is signed up from Houston, so you will be receiving that within the next year if you're in our database. So please sign up. And that's not an obligation. It doesn't mean that you have to go. It just means you'll receive information whenever we have it to present. And so my name is Rebecca Vitzman and I'm HDR Teams Development Coordinator. And then please approach us if you like one of these. And also, if you would like to be a uh, part of Beyond Belief Network and start submitting your hours, uh, let us know.